Hi, I'm Steve North uh, and I'm going to be talking to you about ethical considerations studying animals and technology. So by way of an introduction, we're currently experiencing a, mo a moment in history when the utopian promises of technology are, are somewhat being questioned. As a researcher working at the interface between animals and technology, this makes it essential to critique my own field and to make sure that my technological activities with other animals are truly for their benefit. This is a moment in history when our attitudes to technology are under review, Facebook, personal data usage, etc. As such, it seems a fitting moment to consider the ethics of one, introducing our digital era technologies into the environments of other animals, and two, the responsibilities of those who study the interactions between technology and other animals. That's me. So it's time to ask a couple of questions. Question one, is it sufficient that our own studying of a process does not directly result in harm if the eventual outcome of the process itself is harmful and potentially lethal for the other animal? Question two, when we embed ourselves in the world of other animals, can we partition our own involvement, for example, attempts to improve enrichment and welfare, and then just walk away from the consequences of the practices under study? A bit of context. So imagine a relatively new research field with a focus on the interactions between humans using all digital era technology, between computers using digital era technology and non-human animals. The researchers working in this field are attempting to identify common ethical principles. This field is ACI, Animal Computer Interaction. So what is ACI? It looks at the relationship between animals and technology. It might include enrichment technologies directly used by the animal, elephant toys in the zoo cats playing with tablets, hunting games for cats, improving the lives of working dogs, cancer detection, welfare monitoring tools, etc. So we can say that animals have interacted with our technology throughout human history. Now animals interact with our computer-based systems, whether they know it or not. The lack of an animal perspective on system design can have a negative effect on both the animal users themselves and the purpose for which animal technology is developed. And this references uh, Animal Computer Interaction ACI Manifesto by Clara Mancini, which is considered to be the kind of fundamental first paper that tried to describe this field. ACI, what kind of focus does it have? Well, it, it's studying the interaction between animals and technology in naturalistic settings around specific animal activities or interspecies or transspecies relations. Two, developing user-centered technology that can improve animals' welfare and support animals in their activities. And three, informing user-centered approaches to the design of technology intended for animals derived from both interaction design and from animal science. Thinking about ACI and ethics, because that's why we're here and what I'm talking about. Previous ACI conferences, there's an annual international conference, have considered animal technologies that do or do not constitute good examples of or models for ACI, legitimate technological applications for ACI, implications of ACI's animal-centered perspective for conducting research that involves animal participants. Thus far, ACI researchers have tended to be animal allies with an interest in enrichment and welfare, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. So Clara Mancini, whose paper I, I mentioned briefly a couple of slides back, she came up in this paper here towards an animal-centered ethics for compu animal computer interaction, which is at the bottom here. So not this is different from the manifesto paper. Uh, her five ethical principles for animal-centered research in ACI. That's in 2017. Number one, respecting and caring for every participant without discrimination. Two, garnering participants mediated and contingent consent. Three, doing research that is relevant to participants and consistent with their welfare. Four, avoiding research procedures that may be harmful to participants. Five, assessing research proposals and obtaining expert support. For example, did these studies get ethics committee approval within the author's institutions? Was an animal behavior expert consulted? These kind of things. You might notice in principle two, 
Uh, the language might need a little bit of unpacking and consideration. Mediated in this context means having a human guardian who knows them well enough to decide if a proposed technologically mediated experience or context is appropriate for them. Is it safe for them? And is it in the non-human's overall interest? Now, we should note here that I have concerns about this. Knowing them well is not the same as acting in their best interest, and a capturer may know a captive well. But we can say more on this later. Then there's contingent in principle two as well, contingent consent. Um, that is consent that may be withdrawn at any time if something changes. The non-human is not consenting to continuing an experience just because they started it, or at least that's the theory, but it's obviously depending on who is, who is mediating on their behalf. So how does ACI differ from computational anthrozoology? Now, computational anthrozoology is a term that I coined. It's an area of anthrozoology that both, one, uses computers to study human interspecies relations, the computer as the lens, and two, studies human interspecies relationships that are themselves mediated by computers, the computer under the lens. The difference between ACI and computational anthrozoology compass always requires the subjects of the study to be interaction between one or more non-human species and human animals, whereas ACI's subject might be one or more non-human species. ACI has no requirement for human animals to be the subject of the study. It's purely about the interaction between the machines and the non-humans. Non In both cases, ACI or COMPAS, technology is always involved, either as the lens or under the lens. In ACI, it's non-humans possibly interacting with humans. In COMPAS, it's non-humans always interacting with humans. For ACI, the focus is on the technology either interacting with the non-human or acting as an interpretive interface between humans and other animals. COMPAS, the focus is on the interaction between the human and the other human, either using technology as an interpretive tool or included in the subject of the human-animal interaction. In this, other, in this context, the meaning of computer may be considered to encompass any digital error technology. The, let's think, think of some examples. The computer as the, as the lens might include the use of computer-based systems to help us understand interactions between humans and other animals. Uh, computer systems as supportive technologies, for example, the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and computer vision to automate the recognition of behaviors and emotions during interactions. It could be citizen science projects. It could be video and audio analysis, where computers are used to support the understanding of the interaction data collected in the field. It could be data session and field work review tools, blah, 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 blah. The computer under the lens might include studying parallels between human non-human animal interactions and human computer interactions as considered by the computer science field of HCI, studying relationships between humans and other animals that are mediated by computers, for example, dogs watching TV with cats, cat, cat enrichment with tablet-based computer games, or horses living in automated housing systems. Computational anthrozoology shares common interests with researchers in the computer science field of animal-computer interaction, ACI. Um, okay, I think we've said enough about that for now. ACI, the early days. A bit of ACI history. Most of the original researchers in the field might best be described as looking at domesticated companion animal enthusiasts, animal lovers with a broadly welfareist perspective on animal ethics. A few of them might be vegan or vegetarian, many of them would be meat eaters, with a deep concern about how farm animals are treated, but not necessarily activists in an animal rights sense. Most of the research at this time in the early days was focused on cats and dogs, as you might expect. As time went by, more zoo species have been represented in ACI work, primates, elephants, etc. And my own work on horses has broadened the represented species and reduced ACI's focus on house-based companion animals. We're going to have a quick look now at a example zoo project. project. This is by Melanie Ford, who actually did the uh, MA Anthrop Zoology Exeter last year. And this is uh, something she presented at an ACI conference. And it's called Digital Enrichment with Captive Siang uh, Video Showcase of Primate Preference. 
really quickly bung through the abstract. Two captive Siang were introduced to digital enrichment through tablet computers. Their behaviours were observed during their interactions with tablet applications to ensure they were active participants in demonstrating their preferences regarding long-term choices, etc. I won't read the rest of it. Let's have a quick look at this video. It's advantageous as it allows for adaptability and cognitive stimulation. Drag this out. Fushing and Jocko are Siming, a species of gibbon who have only known captivity. Captive environments are managed environments where the non-human animals do not have choices in enclosure, food, or enrichment. The pair were introduced to digital enrichment through an iPad and a Galaxy tablet. These computer devices were chosen for both fiscal and physical practicality to fit within budget and physical enclosure constraints. As active participants in the study, it was important to ensure that they had the freedom not only to choose to engage with the tablets, but also have a voice in selecting applications through demonstrating preference. Their interest level in the subject matter was key to their successful learning, as they would ultimately be interacting with the equipment and computer programs on a long-term basis. An ethogram was used to chart the behaviors of Fosheng and Jocko with each application. The collected data displayed their interest preferences in certain applications. Thus, adaptions to the study were made based on the primate's choices. The individual personalities were shown by preference in applications, handedness, sound levels, and vision. The stages of introduction to the technology were food-based reward, grooming-based reward, and ultimately the digital enrichment itself as the reward. Both Fosheng and Jocko displayed positive behaviors towards the digital enrichment and active interest in engaging with the technology independently. Positive behaviors were categorized as calmness, affectionate, sociability, control and engagement, excitement, confidence, and overall enjoyment of the enrichment activities. The long-term goal of this study is to provide a permanent installation of a wireless touchscreen monitor with which they will have independent access. This individual freedom will permit them to select their own enrichment. Opportunity for self-directed enrichment could provide them with a de-stressing activity as well as cognitive engagement and could increase observed levels of well-being. Fosheng and Jocko are both sensitive to their environment and the addition of cameras, recorders, or staff was not conducive to their comfort levels during the study. As a direct result, the photos and videos you view have been taken sparingly and are limited in duration. In conclusion, this study demonstrates that the Siamang have the cognitive ability to interact with. Okay. So if you just bear with me while I move this out of the way. So, another category, ACI, dogs with jobs. There's always been ACI work on dogs with jobs, cancer detection, support animals, things like that. We're going to have a look at another video now. Um, this is um, by Clara Mancini at the Open University, uh, and it's about using dogs for detecting cancer with a technology, technology involvement. Yes. So... And you have to bear with me while I do a bit of resizing here. This is a dog who has been trained to detect cancer cells by sniffing biological samples of urine, sweat or breath. Cancer growth emanates volatiles from cancer cells, which can be found, for example, in urine, sweat or breath. Our noses aren't sophisticated enough to detect these volatiles. However, dogs have superhuman sense of smell, so they can. At the moment, the dog can express yes or no. For example, if he sits in front of the stand, it means that he has found some cancer cells in the sample. If he moves away from the stand, it means that he hasn't found anything in the sample. However, we are developing a canine interface that will allow the dog to express more nuances in his detection. Well, the work that the OU is doing in collaboration with medical detection is massively important. It allows our dogs to communicate with their client or the handler a lot more effectively. The Open University is the first academic institution to have created a research program in animal-computer interaction. 
This is our dedicated animal computer interaction lab where we prototype all our technologies. The program aims to understand the relation between animals and technology, to design technologies that can support animals in different ways, and to inform animal centered research approaches to developing technology intended for them. I'm thrilled with the progress that we are making so far, but there is so much more to be done. If we expect dogs to help us out, then it is only fair that we give them the technology to support them. Okay, so that was something on Dogs with Jobs by Clara Mancini at the Open University. A bit of housekeeping going on here, moving things around. Let's move on. But wait, what are the ethics of ACI again? I started to have emerging concerns about putting non-humans in the way of harm without their consent. I first became aware of my own ethical concerns when at one year's ACI conference, work was presented on explosive detection dogs, a bit, bit like the ones shown on this slide. For me, this crossed the line into an area where the dog would be completely unaware of the potential risks, negative outcome, possibly fatal. This seems to me to be putting non-humans in the way of harm without their consent. This seems significantly different to, if not a sea change away from jobs that might be perceived by the non-human as play, simulated social activities or interaction with human guardians, which you can, some of the cancer detection work we can, we're just looking at, you can see that in that context, they, that it could be pleasurable to the dogs, they might not view it as something they would be made to do. Whilst in the vegan context, any job is a form of exploitation, many non-vegan, non-human animal allies, not remotely concerned by the ethics of, say, sheep dogs, assistant dogs, would also be disturbed by the idea of putting their animal friends, possibly unwittingly, into a dangerous situation, such as explosives detection. As shown here, this is the US Coast Guard. This image came from, they've got a great site with lots of pictures of the dogs working. So is there a line between acceptable and unacceptable ACI research? It's fairly simple. There are, exa there are ex examples of ethically acceptable and acceptable ACI. We can find projects and technology uses that most people, and I'm excluding weird vegans such as myself from this, would be okay with, with. And those projects that most people would not be okay with. So let's unpack that a little bit more. Here's an example of something that I consider to be acceptable ACI. This is the National Geographic Encounter Ocean Odyssey under the headline, Vegan Prince Bring Brings Fish-Free Aquarium to Saudi Arabia. This was reported in the media in, in this year, April 2018. Uh, it will be expanding to 10 regions in the Middle East, particularly Saudi Arabia by 2019, thanks to a partnership between National Geographic and General Entertainment Authority of Saudi Arabia and also KBW Ventures. Now, I think there are lots of positives for the non-humans here. They don't actually have to be in captivity. The human animals can learn about them and may want to help conserve them from the lessons they've learned through experiencing their behavior. Humans retain a connection with the natural world through experiences like this without requiring non-humans to pay the price. But weirdly, this is an ACI experience that doesn't involve a direct interaction between technology and a non-human. In anthropological terms, the humans and the animals are not even directly interacting. Instead, the technology acts as a representative or a cipher for the non-human, benefiting the non-humans, but also distancing themselves from true trans-species interactions. It's, it's interesting, but I certainly feel it's something I would want to put in the acceptable bracket. Examples of unacceptable ACI, anyone who did the, the, uh, the week on animal computer interaction with me on the, on the uh, anthropology MA will, might recognize this image, and I talked about it a little bit there. Uh, this is Kurt system. It's a fitness training for racehorses. They claim it's designed to introduce young racehorses to training gradually under a pre-designed racing program. The horse isn't pulling the four and a half ton vehicle, rather the vehicle keeps pace with the animal and the trainers fit the horse with equipment such as electrocardiogram machines, oxygen masks and movement sensors to monitor its performance. They can then subtly regulate the horse's speed for optimal training. I think we might have a little bit of a look at that. Let's see. 
but this is no amusement park ride. In the horse racing heartland of Lambourne, it's a 20 million pound, 1.5 kilometer undercover track, capable of taking 10 horses at a time, from walking pace right up to a gallop, around 30 miles an hour. Its aim by removing jockeys is to remove human error from early training of young racehorses. Mistakes can be costly, but they expect this facility will increase the odds of horses reaching the racetrack. A lot of young horses have injuries in the beginning of the training because they are not ready to uh, start the, the, the real training. Such cutting edge technology has unsurprisingly caught the attention of the racing industry who were keen to set eyes on it for the first time. It's an amazing thing to come and see, you know, I never thought that I'd see something like this in my lifetime. And like, you know, to train a racehorse or, or, or to be successful in any sport, it's all about trying to find that repetition that makes you successful. Okay, I think we'll leave that there, and get the general idea. Lots of enthusiasm in the racing industry. But for me, that's an unacceptable use of ACI. It further removes the human from interacting with the horse and makes the, the horse into even more of a, a commodity that can be disposed of that's just slotted into a machine. I can't see any positive outcome there for the horse. Here's another thing that I review as unacceptable use of ACI. This is um, primates being used by NASA in space travel. Before humans went into space, several other animals were launched, including numerous other primates, so scientists could investigate the biological effects from space travel. The US launched flights containing primate passengers primarily between 1948 and 1961, with one flight in 1969 and one in 1985. France launched two monkey-carrying flights in 1967. The Soviet Union and Russia launched monkeys between 1983 and 1996. I think we have another slide showing a slightly more disturbing picture of that. This really looks as though the animal's embedded in the technology. It makes me uncomfortable, and the outcome for the animal is unlikely to be a good one. How about a fictional example of unacceptable ACI? In uh, 2017 CBS series on Netflix, Star Trek Discovery, which was a reboot of the long-running Star Trek franchise, in the aptly named episode, The Butch's Knife Cares Not for the Lamb's Cry, we saw Ripper, an, an alien creature resembling a giant tardigrade, exploited via technology uh, and effectively tortured. Let's look at some pictures of, of him. So here we can see the the, the large tardigrade creature. Ripper is an alien creature resembling a giant version of Earth's microbial tardigrade or water bear. Initially thought to be highly aggressive and despite his enormous strength his behavior turned out to be defensive and he's a herbivore. The crew of the Starship Discovery work out that Ripper has a symbiotic relationship with the spores used to power an experimental spore drive which the crew have possession of but are unable to use. The spore drive allows travel along a, a mycelial network which seemingly connects the physical space and multiple dimensions of the universe. Ripper's species appears to have extensive knowledge of this mycelial network. It slowly becomes apparent that the Ripper has been used as a navigator by the originators of the spore drive, solving the problem of navigation over long distances. To work the spore drive, Drive, Ripper by a harness of electronic clamps attached to his body. The process causes visible distress to Ripper, but the Discovery's captain, who is obsessed with winning a war against a dangerous adversary, puts aside the Federation's famous Prime Directive, which forbids Starship crews from using their superior technology to impose their own values or ideals on other species. It has to be remembered this is a much darker version of Star Trek than earlier incarnations. Explorers are now recast as warriors, with exploration and ethical frameworks considered a luxury reserved for peacetime. This is reflected in the entire noirish look of the show, and little details such as the addition of a black alert as an emergency status. Here we can see Ripper connected to the equipment clamped onto his body. 
and he's kind of held in a, a tank where the, the, the mycelial spores are all swimming around him and he's feeding on them. Eventually, one crew member is unable to live with the pain and torture which Ripper is enduring in order for the starship to fulfill its mission. She decides that Ripper needs to be free and releases him into space with the supply of mycelium spores. Once outside the Discovery, Ripper is revived and jumps himself via the mycelial network to an unknown destination. And that's the end. But I would suggest that, fictional as it is, this is an unacceptable use of ACI and a future that I, I think we should be striving to avoid although we have a history of exploiting non-humans in this way using our technologies. If any time you look at the appropriation of another animal's strength as, as happened to the horse and the cow and many other animals, donkeys, they've all been used because of their superior capabilities and we've not been too concerned about using our technology even if it was hard technologies to control them. What about examples of grey area ACI? This is, this is quite visually quite an interesting one dynamically altering the colour of aquatic animals without injury by augmenting aquarium. This is an ACI paper. Um, I'll read you a little bit of abstract. We propose an augmented aquarium that dynamically alters the colour of translucent aquatic animals without injury. This technology produces coloured aquatic animals that glow in the dark in a st standard fish tank at home. For regulating the colour, a monitor displaying colours is installed behind the fish tank. Um, now, they're saying that this, is, uh, this technology does not require injurious procedures as required by previous painting methods such as injections of dyes and tattoos by lasers. In this study, we describe the representation capability of colour and the variation depending on the types of aquatic animals. Now, I don't really quite understand why you'd be wanting to do this to fish, but this is obviously something that gets done. So let's have a little bit of a look at this. Keeping beautiful aquatic animals in a fish tank at home is not always feasible. As a result, aquatic animals have been artificially coloured to appeal to consumers by harmful procedures. In this research, we propose an augmented aquarium dynamically changes the colour of aquatic animals to any colours without injury. For controlling the colour, a monitor displaying a pattern is installed behind the fish tank. The fish tank becomes dark owing to the light shielding caused by the combination of polarising sheets on the fish tank. Translucent aquatic animals change the optical property and the background pattern can be viewed only through the bodies. Accordingly, the aquatic animals seem visibly coloured. This technology does not require harmful procedures for painting them such as injections of dyes and tattoos by lasers. In the paper we describe the representation capability of colour and the differences depending on the types of aquatic animals. We also investigated on the safety aspect of this technology, the potential interaction by monitoring the behaviours of the aquatic animals. Aquaprism, dynamically altering the colour of aquatic animals without injury by augmenting aquarium. So, it's very restful looking at the fish. I'm still not quite clear why people want to colour them. But, on the other hand, they are trying to use technology to do this that doesn't physically, isn't physically invasive to the fish. So, what do we say? Is this a grey area? Good, good use of technology? Poor use of technology? It's, it's hard, hard to call it. And my own ACI work, where does this sit? Um, my own project, Habit, Horse Automated Behaviour Identification Tool, is an ACI project that used computers as the lens. Habit aims to improve health welfare by using computers, specifically machine learning and computer vision, to recognise the natural range of equine behaviours. This technology can be applied in a variety of situations to give horses a voice. This, work by, uh, this works by, for example, identifying behaviours that are relaxed versus those that indicate stress and pain. Habit may also be used to evaluate horses' responses to new systems introduced into their environment. These may be hard systems such as housing, feeding, enrichment, as well as technological systems. So what do you think? Do you think this is acceptable, unacceptable, or a grey area? I like to think it's acceptable. 
uh, you can, we can have a little bit of a look here at a video of mine. This is actually um, this video, something I did at ACR last year, and it just shows some automatic identification of horses, focusing on specific features. In this case, the years as a simple way to identify horses using the computer, both in images and in video. train the software. This is a visualization of the different graphical shapes being applied to identify a horse. This is slowed down, so this will all be happening very fast inside the computer. And during the training period, it learns which graphical blocks can be used most quickly in combination to identify a particular thing like a horse or a person's face. diagram of how the software works. So this is true positives means correctly identified horses. So these are still images that were fed to the software and it's it's drawn the green box to indicate where it sees the feature in this case ears. to video of wild horses, semi-feral probably I should say accurately. I love how that horse on the right king of his ears. I was doing that that sort of nice and friendly in a certain point I'm going to pin my ears. to a commercial video to film the Black Stallion. And there's, a, there's a human detector in there as well as a horse detector. The actual practical use of this was to apply it to long bits of video footage to pull out sections that had horses on for the processing. So if you just wanted to, if I could apply it to the Black Stallion, it would just chop out all the bits that had horses in. Right, we're not going to finish that, that's enough of that. Gives you a bit of an idea of the kind of things I've been doing in the past. So how did I start to deal with my ethical concerns for the ACI 2017 conference? Well, there were two main ways. Providing ethical guidelines which specifically explain the considerations for an ACI project. This is to people who are applying, sending in papers to be considered. Providing shepherding, that is, assigning an experienced ACI researcher or researchers to guide the authors in the revision of a paper that would be rejected on ethical grounds for not demonstrating an understanding of being animal-centered, etc., and turning it around into a paper that might be accepted. There's no guarantee that going through the shepherding process would produce an acceptable paper because the authors might not understand still quite what is required of them. So examples from ACI 2017 that required ethical consideration before acceptance. Here's a paper called Enrichment for Pigs Improving Animal Environment Relations. Um, quick bit of the abstract. This paper provides a brief introduction on the welfare of pigs in the European Union with a special emphasis on their specific exploratory needs. After describing the requirements of legislation and the main welfare challenges for the swine species, we will explore the case of Italian heavy pigs intended for dry cured Parma ham production. Oh dear. And describe the peculiar welfare issues in this production system. Lastly, we will address the directions in which we will see potential collaboration with the technology, etc. So, have a quick bit of a look at uh, enrichment for pigs. If I can. Hold on, I'll just get it big. Let's just get it sorted out in large view. Okay.
one that, that came up and, and required some shepherding. Obviously, they were from food, a food production background. Um, and so we had to explain to them why there might be concerns about the housing, about all kinds of aspects of it, and ask them to address it, which I believe they did in the final version. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, something else here. I right, okay. I came up with some some ethical guidelines for framing non-human and nano-based research in an ACI context. So this was sent out to people who required shepherding, whose paper had not been accepted like the, like the previous one, before we asked them to make some changes. Um, so I started by saying, please note references in this document to animals should be interpreted as meaning non-human animals. Then. One, the ACI context is predominantly animal-centered. Two, I would suggest that you read Clara Mancini's paper towards an animal-centered ethics for animal-computer interaction, and then I attached it as a PDF. Three, you may find it useful to think about the reframing of animal research from an animal-centered perspective. Four, also I would suggest bearing in mind my own comment that, quote, our commitment to non-human animals is build only what they want or need, unquote. How do you think your, your work relates to this statement? Five, if this is welfare-focused technology, perhaps there needs to be discussion about how this is improving the well-being of the studied animals, irrespective of their intended ultimate use, for example, death in the case of meat animals, or potentially shortened lifespan and stress in the case of dairy animals. Six, you need to demonstrate your understanding that ACI studies practices with negative outcomes for animals may be controversial to some in an animal-centered community. This is the case even where the ACI researcher is not directly involved in the negative outcome. For example, it happens after the study or it's considered socially a socially accepted practice. Seven, please explain why you believe that your research is justifiable, improve welfare, etc. Eight, if you've not yet undertaken your research, consider how you can make the design process animal-centered. For example, how might any technical intervention be perceived by the animal? Is training habituation required in order to introduce a technology? Have you looked into using vo the voluntary cooperation protected contact training technique practiced in progressive zoos? Does the animal have an option to withdraw? Is the animal's behavior modified by your technology? And how do you measure this? Nine, if your study has already been completed, it may, may be put, um, it may still be possible to retrospectively make this work more animal-centered. Ten, I would suggest demonstrating that you've reflected on these issues and that there is some brief discussion of them. Eleven, the easiest way to resolve this might be to include a new short section and subsection with a title such as Ethics, Welfare and Animal-Centered Design, or however you want to phrase it. Twelve, alternatively, you might find ways to reflect on ethical and user-centered design in the paper sections where it's most appropriate. So. I sent that out to everybody who was getting shepherding, and I probably would suggest sending it out actually to, before people ever submit papers, but that's still to be discussed. Um, shepherding a paper submitted to the ACI conference from researchers in animal science, veterinary, agricultural, and less animal-centered computer science disciplines. These tend to be the areas where we get papers in from people who are enthusiastically wanting to get involved with ACI, which is great, but perhaps don't quite come from the same position that, that many other researchers in the area do. In 2017, there were two other papers shepherded. I pig towards tracking the behavior of free roaming pigs and gait anomaly detection in dairy cattle. Actually, the same authors for both of those papers. We haven't got a lot of time to go through the abstracts for those in details. Um, but what I think I might do, let's see what the next one slide is, is how the submitters responded to our suggestions for ethical reflection. So let's look at the gait anomaly detection in dairy cattle paper. Um, after shepherding to this paper, they added, quote, this section describes a controlled experiment we designed following an animal-centered research methodology and applying ACI ethical guidelines. Previous work in automatic lameness recognition studied the gait of lame cows by forcing cows with different degrees of lameness to walk while their motion was being recorded. However, forcing an animal in pain to walk would be unacceptable for an animal-centered research approach and would vi violate several ethical principles ac accepted in ACI. And then it, they, they referenced Clara's main paper. 
Later on, they said, in order to cause a change in the walking pattern of cows, we decided to attach a plastic block to one of their hind hooves. Veterinarians usually attach such plastic blocks to cow hooves in order to relieve pain and allow an injured claw to heal. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Our procedure consisted of the following steps. We let cows walk normally during a period of less than 10 minutes. I'm going to jump ahead. We consider this approach to be the most appropriate for an animal-centered research among the other approaches we considered because it does not involve pain and requires a considerable shorter intervention to a cow's daily activity. The intervention to cow's daily activities lasted approximately 40 minutes, 10 minutes for the attachment of the sensor and recording of normal walking. This was repeated on three different occasions and 30 minutes for the attachment of the plastic blocks. So. I think they have addressed some of it. They've understood where we had issues with it. I'm still concerned that this is a paper about making cows uncomfortable in order to study lameness. It doesn't quite seem sit well with me, but you, you can see how changes were made to this. So were the ACI 2017 ethical interventions successful? Um, I think that requiring authors to consider ACI ethical guidelines and to receive advice is better than accepting without a critique or rejecting papers without an explanation. However, this intervention is only valid for researchers that have not performed research that is fundamentally unacceptable to an ACI audience. Perhaps it would be better to publicize our ethical framework on the conference submission portal to clearly set out our principles. There might be resistance to this from within ACI on the basis that we want to be inclusive and to reach out to researchers that are not animal-centered. I'm concerned that we might simply be coaching authors in how to get over our ethical bar, but it is a start. Revisions and additions that I'd like to make to Mancini's ACI principles. Uh, so here's a quick reminder. I won't read them through again, but they're on screen for you again, and you can find them in the, in the reference that I provided for it earlier. Let's go straight to the changes. Not that Clara would probably agree to them, but this is this is what I would like to see. I think the work basic is great, but there's some, some aspects of it that concern me. Um, revising principle two, garnering participants mediated and contingent consent. Um, Mancini says, quote, one approach to the issue is seeking consent for animals via mediators who are capable of comprehending the implications of the research in relation to the animal's welfare requirements. On mediators, Clara says, such agents should also have a vested interest in prioritizing the welfare of the animals concerned. I would argue that, that where mediators have a purely commoditized relationship with the non-human, this is not true advocacy. They're not really allies to the non-human. I wouldn't trust many such mediators to decide that contingent consent had been withdrawn by the non-human. So I think this needs looking at. Principle four, I believe that principle four should include avoiding any research that indirectly supports practices that by definition result in the suffering, distress, lasting physiological or psychological harm or death of the subject. This is the case even where such practices are considered socially acceptable and justified as being in the greater interest of human animals. To be truly animal-centered, ACI must always act as an advocate for other animals. This embraces a framing of animal welfare that recognizes that the evolutionary drive to resist death and to express free will are fundamental to any concept of an individual's welfare. To respect this partnership with animal participants and to avoid speciesism, ACA researchers should not col uh, collaborate and form research partnerships with human individuals, organizations and businesses whose practices are incongruent with positive outcomes for other animals and or who commodify the non-humans. It's not sufficient that our own ACI research does not directly result in harm if the eventual outcome for the other animal is harmful and potentially lethal. When we embed ourselves in the world of other animals, we cannot partition our own involvement. For example, attempts to improve enrichment and welfare and then simply walk away from the consequences of practices under study. As an alternative, ACI researchers could use technology to advocate for non-humans in harmful situations by demonstrating their sentience uh, or the complexity of their lives, because sentience isn't always the key issue here, pain, it's still possible to, to have negative adverse reactions without being sentient. For example, an alternative to working with farm animals might be to study the same species in companion animals at a rescue or sanctuary environment. 
<coughs> this is how we move towards truly being animal centered. It's, you want to have a drink? So what about bringing symbiotic ethics into the picture? Um, as somebody from the Exeter Anthropology Symbiotic Ethics Working Group, how does symbiotic ethics relate to the study of animals and technology? <coughs> um, if a researcher studies a technological interaction that has short-term benefits, but that is ultimately harmful to them, does this constitute life improvement? I would suggest that uh, short term quality of life might be improved. The non human would be surprised to be told that life improvement does not include a lifespan cut short by being killed. I would argue that researchers cannot claim to be truly animal centered in their thinking unless they, one, recognize other animals as being ethically significant, two, grasp the perspectives of the non human, three, understand the full context of the interaction between the non human and the technology, the behaviours expressed by the non-human, the physical, political, cultural and social landscapes and any other interactions occurring between other living agents in the studied environment including humans. Four, appreciate that any research or the context and processes within such research is conducted must ultimately improve the lives of the non-human subject. Five, recognise that these steps are both a moral imperative and the only way to truly understand the subject of your research. That would render ACI ethics congruent with Easy's take on symbiotic ethics in anthropology. Okay, let's go and try and answer the questions, the two questions from the beginning. That will be fun. Question one, is it significant, blah, 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 is it sufficient that our own studying of a process does not directly result in harm if the eventual outcome of the process itself is harmful and potentially lethal for the other animal? I would say no, I'd argue that the term animal-centered as considered fundamental to ACI should exclude negative outcomes for animals, not just those outcomes directly caused by the researchers but also those caused by the studied context or the process itself. Two, when we embed ourselves in the world of other animals, can we partition our own involvement and then walk away from the consequences, the practices and the study? No, I believe that researchers should grasp the perspectives of the non-human and appreciate that any research or the context and processes within which such research is conducted must ultimately improve the lives of the non-human subject. This is borrowed from symbiotic ethics that we just talked about. It is also difficult to defend the position that you can contribute to a non-human's welfare and then walk away from their greatest welfare issue of all, avoidance of being hurt or killed. They've evolved to avoid being murdered. Violations to their adaptations impact on their welfare. Therefore, being killed is a welfare issue, and welfare considerations do not cease to apply just, be just before their life is ended by a human. Okay, we're drawing to a close here now. I'm going to wrap this up fairly quickly. Um, animal centered means different things to different people. The conundrum is balancing an all inclusive field of research that might deliver incremental research improvements for the non human versus, versus an absolutionist ethical position which views any participation in a process leading to a negative outcome as collaboration in that outcome. So here we are, some fairly fundamental conclusions here. Providing researchers from non animal centered fields with an ethical framework, such as the, gui the guidelines that I went through earlier. This may help to educate, but it might also help to discourage submissions to make ACI look like an echo chamber. We only like to listen to papers from people who agree with us. Or even to coach researchers in how to sound woke, how to say the right things and get over the bar and get their paper accepted, but with no serious moral commitment themselves. Um, ACI conference should have an ethics policy clearly explaining and justifying our princes, principles, welcoming submissions from diverse fields but requiring all researchers to explain how their work is truly animal centred. Animal centred should be redefined to exclude negative outcomes for animals, not just those outcomes directly caused by researchers but also those caused by the studied context or process itself. 
for as an alternative to, to legitimizing harm, ACI researchers could use technology to advocate for non-humans in harmful situations. I think I mentioned this earlier, the idea that uh, it could be done in a rescue or a sanctuary environment. Okay. Um, ACA might include projects with technological enrichment, welfare improvements for exploited farm species, but this should stop short of working on projects for non-humans with a predictable terminal outcome. Mancini's ACI Principle 2 should be revised. Only, only true allies for non-humans not should be speaking for them, not those who seek to commodify and exploit them. Principle 4 should be revised. Um, and I've given a suggested wording for that. And as we come down to the bottom, number eight, to be truly animal-centered and to ultimately improve the lives of research subjects, I'm calling for ACI ethics to be reframed in the context of symbiotic ethics. And that's it. I'm going to leave it there in case anybody wants to ask me any questions. That's great. Thank you for your time on this.